Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for coming here. My name, for those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. We incorporated MS Views and News in 2008. We did this for a reason because we found that there's a great need for these kinds of programs. Why? Because there are others that are doing a program maybe mainly or maybe about specifically one medication with just one speaker. We have found that our programs, always with at least two speakers, are an in-depth view and a wide range of all the MS treatments that are available. We do this with the disease-modifying drugs, and we talk about symptom management, adherence, compliance, MS relapse are all added into the programs these days. It's very important for you all and your caregivers to know everything that's happening with your multiple sclerosis, and that's why we want to be able to provide these kind of programs to you. Sorry for being fumbly, but you know, when I left South Florida, it was almost 80 degrees this morning. It's a little nippy up here. And as you know, this room is a little nippy too. And this is the warmest thing I have to wear. So my fingers aren't really grabbing anything and my brain feels like I got brain freeze. By the way, I too have multiple sclerosis. And that is why I created MS Views and News. That's why our board of directors, we have 10 people on the board, eight of which have MS. Why? Because we, want to, we know what you all want, what you need, what kind of programs to bring you, and we find that this is extremely important. MS Views and News last year provided 31 programs, 30 of which were in the state of Florida, and we held our first program out of the state in Atlanta, Georgia. The people in Atlanta loved it so much, thought the idea was so great, that 175 attended our very first program. Coming up next month, we'll be doing our first program in Birmingham, Alabama. Already 163 are registered to attend that program. In May, we're doing our first program in Charlotte, North Carolina. Already, as of today, 125 are registered. In June, we're doing Atlanta again. And they loved it so much that here we are, three months away, and already 163 are registered for that. It's just we know there's a need. We know there's a need for these kinds of events. Yes. We're located out of, Miami, out of Miami, Florida, okay? But we do get our programs all around the state. We get to Jacksonville at least once a year. We get to Central Florida. We're now predominantly in Central Florida, even more so than South Florida, because there's that great need and because there are others that are doing so many programs in South Florida. We know that there's just, you know, in Central Florida, between Tampa and Melbourne, there's just a tremendous amount of territory to cover. Mary Jane could attest for that. She comes to a lot of our programs. Thank you, Mary Jane. So just to go a little bit further, and before I even continue speaking so much, I want to thank Teva Neuroscience for giving us the grant to do today's program. For those that don't know, Teva makes Copaxone. Also, we want to thank QuestCore Pharmaceuticals for their charitable donation. They make Akthar, which is another, well, Megan will be telling you about this afterwards. In addition to those two, we want to thank Accorda Therapeutics, who makes Empira, the walking medication, Biogen Idec, Biogen Idec, Genzyme, who provides you with Abagio, Novartis, who makes Jelenia, and I also want to thank our volunteers. We have Liz Cruz in the back of the room who does our photography at our programs. We have our MS Views and News staff people that help out too, and that would be Jill today who checked you all in. And of course, I want to thank all of you for coming out on such a beautiful, chilly day and being here to sit and wait for our program to begin, but I do want to thank you all, and so now I'll clap for you. Thank you. So tonight we have to present Megan Weigel, nurse practitioner from where? Here. Jacksonville. Jacksonville Beach. <laughs> After Megan, Dr. Ali Kesrayan. Kesrayan? Kesrayan works. Kesrayan, yeah, something like that. Kesrayan. Kesrayan, Kesrayan. <laughs> well, he'll be here too. He's running a little late today because he had an emergency surgery to do. But Megan's going to cover that extra ground. I'm sure she'll do yes. a great job at it, too. <laughs> 
please, everybody, hold all your questions until after Megan speaks and then after Ali speaks, because what I have to do is run around with a microphone. You will not be video recorded, okay? You will never be seen, but we will hear your voices, okay? And why? Because there are those out there that are going to want to hear the questions. So we need the questions to go, but if I'm not there in time, whoever's answering that question will hopefully just reflect upon it. Before you speak right now, I have to get around to the different support group leaders for them to say something as well. All right, so remember, everybody, during Q&A, I need you to give me exercise. I have another 15 pounds to lose, okay? So I need to run back and forth, zigzag me around the room, all right? So right now, firstly... Okay, thank you. I, I was almost first, but, um, you know, I appreciate this position. Uh, I'm here with my group. Uh, which is the newly diagnosed and therapy options uh, support group. And what we try to do is, is give people who are relatively newly diagnosed uh, a chance to talk to people who are in their same shoes. Uh, several of us uh, meet on a monthly basis. We meet on the third Tuesday of the month. And uh, we are delighted when we have uh, newly diagnosed people who come and, and let us be the sounding board for all their questions. And what we want to do is just be thrilled to death that um, we can help people uh, get along. And so let me turn it over to the next person. Where do they meet? Where do they meet? Memorial Hospital in the Education Complex on the third Tuesday of the month at 6.30 p.m. And who can they call? They can call me at 221-6810. Say it again, 904. 904-221-6810. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Walt. Did we have a little wardrobe malfunction going on up there? Looks that way. Do you need me to wait a minute? Okay, there you go. All right, next up we have Susan Armstrong. Hello. Yes, speak into the uh, I'm Susan Armstrong. I'm the support group leader for the Southside slash Mandarin MS support group. We meet the second Saturday of every month from 2 to 4 p.m. And we meet at the JCA, which is the Jewish Community Alliance at the corner of San Jose and San Clare. We have our monthly meetings and we have it designated so that we have a speaker one month, and we talk the next month, and we alternate talking about MS and having a speaker every other month. We are a very happy group. We do not allow pity parties. We are very a very cohesive group. We get along. We're family. We have fun, and you can come join us anytime you want. Thank you, Susan. How do they get in touch with you? They can call me at 904-396-1082, or they can email me at top number one smurf at juno, J-U-N-O dot com. Thank you very much, Susan. So, okay, you could walk her back. How's that? Thank you, Susan. By the way, everybody. For those that don't know, this is an MS Views and News program. We are not affiliated with any other MS organization. We are, like I said in the past, we are funded for all of our programs, well, I should say 95% of our programs by the pharmaceutical industry. We have to thank them for knowing that the need is there for people to be educated further with what is need to be known for multiple sclerosis. So again, I want to thank the pharmaceutical industry for providing us the grants that they do to do our programs. Okay. You're gonna, you're gonna, uh, whoops, be careful there. I walked backwards, now I can't walk. Sorry. Okay. There you go, thank you. Am I ready? No. No? And now we present Megan Weigel. <laughs> Hi guys, thank you. I have so many microphones on right now, I don't know what's happening, but I trust you'll tell me if I do anything wrong. 
Um, so hi, it's so great to see everybody here tonight. There's a lot of people here and um, it's really nice to be able to speak um, you guys know I do a lot of speaking, and when we speak for pharmaceutical companies, it's really amazing um, that they're able to provide us with so much information, but we're tied to the slides legally. Um, and Is that better? Okay. We're legally tied to the slides, and so it means that there are a lot of questions that you guys might have that um, we can't answer uh, just because of the way um, the federal government um, and the pharmaceutical code called pharma um, tells us and the pharmaceutical companies what they are and are not allowed to do. So we really love when Stu, um, MS Views and News, and other nonprofit organizations um, can put on things like this. And even, even though we are thankful for the pharmaceutical company backing that allows us to eat tonight, we can talk about almost anything we want, which is fun. Um, so tonight, I am going to talk about the adventure of treating multiple sclerosis. And I have a lot of slides here that you guys have seen before, a lot of information um, that you could probably yell out at me without me even going through the slides. So I'm gonna zip through some of this information. Um, let's call it beginner stuff about multiple sclerosis that many of you know. If I go too fast, please just raise your hand and be like, slow down, Megs, I don't get it, okay? Um, but we'll save all questions to the end. And tonight what I'm going to talk about is a brief overview of MS. We're going to talk about relapses and pseudo-relapses, because even if you've had MS for a really long time, sometimes you wonder if what's going on in your body means you have a new lesion or if it's just your disease ha giving you a bad day. Um, and then we're going to talk about the currently available disease-modifying therapies, and not so much about their efficacy, but how to stay on them so that they're effective and so that they work for you. So what is MS? Somebody scream out what MS is at me without looking up out there. No dirty words. Awesome, so that's, that's pretty good. So what happens is in this immune, autoimmune disease, your body, your immune system, attacks the covering around your nerves of your central nervous system. And that results in kind of a, a short out of how electricity gets conducted, kind of like those lights flickering on and off right now. That's how nerve impulses happen in your body when you have multiple sclerosis. And there are little, um, there are shorts, say, in the electrical system. It's inflammatory, causes inflammation. It's degenerative, and what that means is over time, these changes become permanent. Um, they cause changes in your brain that we can see on MRI. They cause changes um, in your body that you can feel and sometimes can be seen. It affects way more than 400,000 people in the world, or in the United States, way more, probably more, uh, more close to a million in the United States, and we can double that worldwide. But it's also the most common a uh, chronic disease of the central nervous system in working aged people, which makes it pretty devastating because it takes people out of their jobs and sometimes it takes people out of their jobs for reasons that you can't see, such as I can't think as well as I used to, or I'm, I'm more tired than I used to be and I find it hard to complete my work. So it's typically characterized by periods of relapse and remission. And symptoms related to MS are reminders that you have the disease. Symptoms may be constant. For example, you may meet people in this room that always have a weak side. Or the symptoms may come and go, like when I'm tired or when I get out of the hot shower, my vision grays out. And as soon as I cool down, my vision improves. So that's a symptom that comes and goes. Relapses and symptoms are different for everyone. So if you look around this room and talk to your table mates, it actually might be hard for you to determine who has and has not MS in this room without really asking some questions. Because MS can look like other things too. So there are other people, you know, that use wheelchairs and, and walkers and things like that for other diseases. So like Lynn says, we have injury to the nerve axons, and we see that on MRI as white spots or plaques, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of that. And this injury can cause permanent neurologic dysfunction. I'm gonna to try to use the laser pointer, this might get a little crazy. Oh, it works, okay. So this is, um, this is a nerve cell body, and this is an axon, and these fluffy, 
I don't really know what color that is, kind of orangey, pinky, um, little balloon right there is myelin. And here what we have is uh, this myelin is gone because your immune system has decided that it's, fo that it's foreign and it doesn't belong there. And so it's going to cause inflammation that causes the, the axon to, um, to become demyelinated. And then eventually what happens is this gets cut because it can't get its nourishment anymore. The myelin is attached to other nerve cells that provide nourishment for the nerve. And when a nerve gets cut like this, that's when we start to see permanent injury. So these are examples of nerve cells. Here, these swollen green ovals, these are nerve cell bodies that have had dying back occur. So along the line here, you see they're not attached to anything. Here is um, demyelination. This green stuff is demyelination. And these are the correlates on MRI. So how many of you have heard the term black hole? When we look at an MRI, we say we don't want to see black holes. Um, we count these. And so these are black holes. So these um, gray little kind of snaky looking squiggly things, those are normal in your brain. Those are sulci. But this, you guys differentiate that from the rest of the dark stuff. That's not normal. That's a black hole. And that black hole is basically, say, this white spot. Same MRI, but different, different sequence, so a different way of looking at things. Under the microscope, this is what MS looks like. So when you, when you take a brain of a person with multiple sclerosis and you dissect it, this is um, a tiny little vein called a venule. And MS plaques are typically, oops, typically um, around these tiny little veins. So this gray spot is an MS plaque. And inside that MS plaque, you would see these swollen, dying back nerve cells. And that's what makes the white spots on MRIs. So typical MRI findings um, include enhancing lesions, which are signs of active disease, inflammation, swelling. Your immune system is attacking something in your, in your brain right at that moment. T2 lesions, which are just what we refer to as white spots or plaques, and also those black holes. And you can see down here some real big black holes. And those are signs of, um, of a lot of, of damage to the, to the nerve cell bodies and also um, of older lesions, perhaps. So we don't know a lot about MS. I just told you all that, right? But the biggest question that everyone has is what causes this disease? Because if we knew what caused it, we could cure it, right? But we don't know what causes it. We do know what is associated with it. And we've determined some pretty important associations over the past five years. One of them is low vitamin D. So if you have lower levels of vitamin D, you're, it's associated with a higher risk of actually getting MS. And it's also associated with a higher relapse rate. So that's why all of a sudden, we've been checking vitamin D levels in the past five, even longer, five years or so. And it may act as a prognostic factor for uh, someone converting from a clinically isolated syndrome or a first episode of MS to actually being diagnosed. We know that Epstein-Barr virus, which is the virus that causes mono, how many of you had mono as a kid, mononucleosis? Um, so a lot of people in the world have been exposed to mono and will have antibodies to it, but every single person with multiple sclerosis has the antibody to the Epstein-Barr virus. So we know that there's an association, and this was finally proven last year. And then smoking. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you're a smoker in the room. I'm just going to tell you that you should stop. <laughs> But smoking is associated with a 50% increased risk of developing MS in anyone. The risk is dose dependent, which means the more you smoke, the greater your risk is. And when you have MS, the more you smoke, the worse your disease is gonna be. And the reason why this is, is simply because smoking cigarettes, it, well, it's a, it's a toxin to the central nervous system and it puts you at risk for a whole host of other things like coronary artery disease, um, heart disease, high blood pressure, different types of cancers and things like that. 
So this is MS. These are the faces of MS that you guys may know. You guys yell out any of those people? Everybody knows Montel. Richard Pryor, the beautiful late Annette. Yeah, Terry Gar. Got some really wonderful people up here. And probably half of them, you'd never know they had the disease. So how is it diagnosed? So I'm gonna go through this quickly so we can get to the good stuff. It's diagnosed by history. You have to tell a good story that lets us know this isn't something else. It's diagnosed by clinical testing like MRI, labs to rule out other conditions. And some of those other conditions might be Lyme disease, B12 deficiency, lupus, other things that can cause white spots in the brain. Sometimes we do a lumbar puncture to firm up the diagnosis. And then there are other tests done, like visual evoked potentials. That's the test where you look at a um, checkerboard and they measure how your um, optic nerves connect to your brain. But it doesn't, you don't always have to have all those things. Sometimes the story is picture perfect clear. The bottom line is that there has to be no better explanation for why you're having the neurological symptoms the neurological abnormalities on exam and the abnormalities in your brain to make the diagnosis of MS. And the criteria are pretty strict. I don't expect you to read this. Basically, if you have had one clinical attack, you have to have two or more lesions and then dissemination and time in order to be diagnosed with this disease. If you have two clinical attacks, you don't need as many white spots. But we still have to make sure that this is MS and not something else. And I'll give you a really good example. When I first started practicing, there was a really nice um, woman in her late 50s who came to our practice. And she had diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, heart disease. So she had a lot of white spots on her brain because of hardening of the arteries to her brain which can happen with age and also can happen with those risk factors. And um, she had findings on her exam um, that suggested she had some, some stuff going on that wouldn't have been caused by the things that she had in her brain or her other medical conditions. And no one had ever um, done an MRI of her cervical spine. So this woman was in for a second opinion and um, she was already told she had multiple sclerosis and she was already on medication and we did an MRI of her cervical spine because the white spots in her brain didn't look MS-y. She had a really bad, um, really bad herniated disc that was pressing on her spinal cord. And that's what was causing her bladder problems, her leg problems, so on and so forth. She ended up not having MS. So there has to be no better explanation. Now I know many of you in this room very intimately and there are a lot of people with multiple sclerosis who also have herniated discs. So I'm not telling you that you don't have MS. I'm just saying that we have to make sure that it's not something else. Does that make sense? Okay. So who's affected? A lot more men than women. I'm looking around the room. The ratio is probably correct. About three women to every man men have MS, or three women to every one man. Higher incidence in Caucasians and those of Northern European descent and the average risk of a person in the world getting multiple sclerosis is about one in a thousand. If you have a first degree relative, the risk goes down to about one in 300, which is still a pretty low risk. So what types are there? We've got relapsing remitting MS, the most common type, secondary progressive MS, which happens after you've had relapsing remitting MS for a long time, primary progressive MS, which is a lot less common, um, and primary relapsing MS, which is very rare. I've also added these two other types of MS onto this slide, clinically isolated syndrome, which is when a person comes into the office with a single neurologic event and just one spot. We've ruled out everything. It looks like MS. We're pretty sure it is MS, and we can make a diagnosis of clinically isolated syndrome and put them on a medication to prevent another spot or another relapse and slow down their diagnosis of clinically definite MS. The other one is radiologically isolated syndrome. With the invention of our wonderful MRI that we're so good, we're so good at using them, 
everyone gets one. So sometimes when you stub your toe, you go into the ER because your toe hurts and they say, oh, you need a brain MRI for sure, because there has to be something wrong. In any case, my whole point is that sometimes get, people get brain MRIs and they don't really need them. And sometimes we find things, uh-oh, that we might not really want to see. So sometimes people get brain MRIs for, well, they, they fainted or they have migraine headaches, but they've never had an event that suggests multiple sclerosis. And when you put up their brain MRI, it looks like you ripped it out of a textbook from the MS chapter. There are risk factors for that. Um, that is not something that we treat, but we follow those people very closely. And we know that there are things that put them at greater risk for developing MS. So the natural history of this disease is such that for most people, it starts with relapses. And these little yellow arrows here are MRI lesions. So you can see that the red bars are relapses. For every relapse you have, you're having uh, silent MRI activity, silent brain lesions. And in this early part of the disease, you eventually, you go back to baseline after relapses. But over time, you don't quite go back to baseline. And the reason is because you've lost some brain. You've lost some brain tissue. There's been some atrophy. There's been more white spots. There's been more scars. And so it would, it would be like getting a repetitive injury to your knee. Eventually, you know, it's bone on bone. And so eventually there's going to be a point where we can't make up ground. We can't recover um, what's already happened. What are the most common symptoms? I want you guys to yell some things out here. Don't look up here. Yell out. Common symptoms. Fatigue. Pain. Numbness. Forgetfulness. Visual changes. Brain fog. Imbalance. Good. When, when Dr. Kizrian walks in, everybody yell, urinary dysfunction at him. <laughs> um, so you said basically everything that's up here, um, except for tremor. Everybody else, yep, you said everything. So we know that MS looks different for a lot of people. So how do you know if what you're having today is a relapse or if it's just an exacerbation of what symptoms you have on a regular basis. So we define a relapse as a new neurologic symptom or an old one that is increased in severity and is lasting more than 24 hours and can't be explained by something else. And the usual suspects for the something else are urinary tract infection or other infection, but usually it's a UTI, fever, Overexposure to heat or simply I overdid it, either for a few more hours than usual or maybe for a family reunion or something like that. Fatigue or stress. And so how do we treat a relapse? Well, first of all, if I get a phone call from one of you that has multiple sclerosis and you say, hey, Megan, my right arm is numb. My right arm has never been numb before that's gonna raise a big red flag for me. So I'm gonna be much more likely to think that it's a relapse than a pseudo relapse, because you've never had the symptom. So I would probably still try to figure out if it's something else, like do a little bit of blood work, maybe do a urinalysis, make sure I get you in the office within a couple of days. And if I find something on exam, if anything's changed, and if it's not getting better, we're gonna put you on steroids. We're gonna do steroids one of two ways. One is by IV, so I'm, I bet a lot of you have had IV steroids for three to five days. Um, another is by a hormone called ACTH, which is Acthar. And this hormone stimulates your body to make its own steroids. Um, it is a drug used if you either don't tolerate IV steroids well or you don't completely recover from a relapse with, with IV steroids. And the reason being is it's extremely expensive. Um, and it is, there are, there are patient assistance programs for it, but it still has to go through a prior authorization process with the insurance companies. And, you know, we're all pretty mindful of healthcare resources these days. Um, but if you don't tolerate IV steroids well, this is the drug that we go to. 
the side effect profile of Acthar or ACTH, when you read it out, um, you know, when you pull out that ugly, scary, long, folded sheet that the pharmacist gives you, you're going to read exactly the same side effects. However, many people tolerate this drug better than they tolerate IV steroids. <coughs> Excuse me. For severe relapses, we may recommend plasma exchange. Um, and this would have to be a really big deal because plasma exchange in and of itself is a really big deal. We don't usually give people oral steroids anymore because you have to give them for a long time. They have to have a long, uh, a long taper off of the steroids. And most people want to be done with that stuff right before it's even started. Now, I'll tell you that steroids, they're necessary evil but you don't always have to have them, right? So what are you guys going to say? You just walked in. <laughs> so steroids come with their own set of evils. And if you get them over time, you can have problems with cholesterol, blood sugar, bones, all sorts of things. So if you're having a relapse that really isn't affecting your life, like let's say you're right-handed and you have some tingling on the left side of your body and we determine that it is a relapse, it is related to new inflammation, we might decide not to do steroids because what the steroids are going to do or what the Axar is going to do is it's going to make it get better faster, but in the long run, it's not going to matter whether you get steroids or not. We give you steroids or we give you Acthar so that you can get better faster. Does that make sense? What I hear from some people is they, they, they think, well, my goodness, I, I've had a lot of relapses and I didn't get steroids. So does that mean my MS is worse now? And I want you to understand that that's not what it means. Okay? So a pseudo-relapse is an increase in severity of a neurological symptom that you're used to having that's caused by one of those something else's, an infection, a fever, stress, fatigue. Most of the time, it's a urinary tract infection. People get so sick of calling me and hearing me say, go to the lab, you know, get a urinalysis. They have those over-the-counter kits um, now that we sometimes use, but I don't like to rely on those um, because we can't give you necessarily the right antibiotic if you have a UTI. But an example of this would be, um, well, gosh, I know some people whose kids have gotten married recently, and they're like planning the wedding, and they're out of town forever, and, um, and they're super stressed out, and there's financial things and, and perfection things and all these things going on, and they're like, they come in and they're like, I, I'm just weaker, my legs aren't working right, I'm more tired. Um, and most of the time, if there's no UTI, if there's no other infection, then we can relate this to fatigue and stress and doing too much. And I know a lot of you in this room and a lot of you try to do too much. But it's really hard to find, you know, that line of all the things you need to do and when you need to slow down. So how do we treat a pseudo-relapse? Well, we treat the problem. We treat the infection. We give you a pep talk. We might tell you to take a little bit of rest, right? Um, sometimes I might even write that down. Um, we may adjust medications to treat your symptoms. So if, if your pseudo-relapse is burning pain in your feet or your hands um, or, or um, you know, very uncomfortable eye movements or something like that, well, we might adjust your medication a little bit to try to make that better. Um, cooling equipment if needed. So if you're coming in and saying, um, you know, Megan, I'm loving, I had this happen the other day, I'm loving yoga, um, but the next day I can barely get out of bed. So I'm going to say, okay, that's not good. A, how can we modify yoga when, we're, when you're there um, physically? And B, maybe we need to get you some cooling equipment so that things are better for you the next day because your body doesn't heat up so much. So... Does anyone understand, or does everyone understand the difference between a relapse and a pseudo-relapse? For the moment, anyway. Another way to look at it is, what are the symptoms of multiple sclerosis that remind you that you have this disease every day? Tuck those in your pocket. They come around, they show up when you least expect them, when you don't want them, and sometimes every day. 
Um, and those are the things that if they flare up, you can usually say something else is going on in my life that I need to look at. Maybe I'm working too hard, maybe I'm stressed out, maybe I have an infection. Something new, never happened before, total red flag. As a healthcare provider, I would so much rather my, my people call me when something weird is going on than have them come in two months later and say, yeah, you know, I lost my vision for like two weeks last month, but I mean, I just figured it was allergies. <laughs> so like, no, no, please call, call your doctor, call me if I'm your doctor nurse, you know, you, you need to call. All right, here's the meat. Disease-modifying therapies. This is what we all want to hear about, right? Because there are so many now. This landscape is very confusing. It's difficult to navigate. And if you've been on a disease-modifying therapy for a really long time, the same one, and there are all these new ones coming out, you might be thinking, well, am I on like a bad one now because I'm one of, on one of the old ones? So I want to make sure that you guys understand um, how good the, the older ones are and how good the ones we have that are new are and how there's a right one for every person. So disease-modifying therapies change the face of this disease. When I came to practice in 2001, there were three. And now there are 11. 10? I'll get to the chart and count. Um, and so we know that these older therapies and the newer therapies, they're very effective. We know that for the most part, they're safe. And when there are adverse events associated with them, they are usually things that we can monitor for. Um, but some of the newer therapies do require a higher level of vigilance on my part as the person prescribing them and on your part as the person taking them. In any case, no matter what you're taking, it's only going to work if you use it. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So 11 FDA-approved disease-modifying therapies. And here's a chart. You don't have to try to read this. I'm going to read it for you. Can you ever, I'm, am I in the way over here? Can you guys see? OK. Am I still in the black box? Yes. All right, so Avonex, intramuscular injection weekly. With that injection, you might have some flu-like symptoms. Because it's an intramuscular injection, you don't usually get injection site reactions. We do watch your blood count, and we watch your liver enzymes, and we very rarely see anything happen. Um, and we also monitor for depression. Avonex is one of the four interferons, um, and interferons have been associated with a higher incidence of depression. Um, and I'm just going to say globally right now, as a female, you really don't want to get pregnant on any of these medications. Um, Copaxone is probably OK, um, but just globally, we'll keep it at that. Interferon beta-1A is Rebif. Interferon beta-1B is beta-seron and Extavia. And so both of uh, beta-seron and Extavia are the same thing. These are subcutaneous um, injections of interferon. Rebif is given three times a week, beta-seron and Extavia every other day. We monitor the same things and worry about the same things as we do with Avonex. The reality of it is these drugs have been around for a really long time, almost 20 years, and they are extremely safe and they are very effective. Copaxone, 20 milligrams, three, uh, 20 milligrams daily or 40 milligrams three times a week, which I know many of you are enjoying in this room. <laughs> to go from a daily injection to three times a week is pretty cool. So Copaxone, really what we have to monitor for is your injection sites. Um, are, they, are they red? Are they itchy? Are you having any infection? Are you losing skin? Because over time, with all of these subcutaneous injections, interferons included, you can get this kind of dimpling effect. And then if you, don't, if you use those spots, the medicine doesn't get absorbed. Um, but safe, 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 safe. Natalizumab or Tysabri, 300 milligrams IV once a month. Um, most people tolerate this medication without any difficulty. Sometimes people complain of headache or back pain um, for a few hours or maybe the day after their infusion. There is an increased risk of certain types of infections, um, and some of the infections can be serious. So those are things that we monitor for, like herpes infections and um, more rare types of um, sinus infections and pneumonias. 
Um, and what we do with this drug is we monitor your blood count, we monitor your liver enzymes, and we check something called a JC virus antibody. Now, Tysabri is associated with a virus called PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. If you spell that, you get Stu's t-shirt. <laughs> no, I'm not going to try. Um, and that, that is a disabling and or fatal central nervous system infection. Um, the risk of that is determined by whether or not you have the JC virus antibody, how long you've been on the drug, whether or not you've ever had prior exposure to chemotherapies, like things you would take for cancer, or um, there's a couple of drugs that are rarely used in MS anymore that we still consider as risk factors. Um, and if you become JC virus antibody positive, we can stratify your risk or tell you what that risk of PML is um, by an index value um, that we can now measure. And this is all, uh, these are all things that, that Biogen, who makes the medication, has done um, really to help us use the drug more safely. The overall risk of PML is about uh, one per 1,000. If you are antibody negative, the risk is 0 0.01 per 1,000, which is essentially nothing. Um, but over time, we need to, to monitor to see if your antibody status changes. So teraflunamide is Obagio, once a day oral medication. We usually give the 14 milligram dose. This is one of our, this is our second oral. I'm gonna give um, accolades to Jelenia just real quick because Lisa's out there and she's probably listening to me. And it was the, Jelenia was the first oral medication for MS. Whole new era for you guys. Um, so teraflunamide, Obagio, 14 milligrams a day. We monitor monthly for the first six months blood count, and liver enzymes. There's about an 8% post-marketing incidence of liver enzyme abnormality. Um, we do a TB test. There were a couple of cases of TB in the clinical trial, so now we do a TB test before we, we put you on the drug. And it's a pregnancy category X drug, not just for women, but also for men. So if you're a male taking this drug and um, you and your wife want to try to get pregnant, you, you should not be on the drug. We need to stop the drug, and, and if you want to imminently get pregnant, if you're a male or if you're a woman that wants to imminently get pregnant and is on the drug, we can do something called a rapid elimination. Um, and there are a couple of medications that you can take 11 doses of, and the drug binds to it, and it gets eliminated from your system. Otherwise, it can take up to two years to get rid of the drug. So it's really important, um, especially because MS is a disease mainly of people in childbearing age. So it's really important that we talk about this. Um, the most common side effects that I see are diarrhea and hair thinning. They're transient. Um, it's not like chemotherapy, hair loss. The hair thinning is like more hairs on the pillow, hairs on the brush. Um, and within six to 11 months, your hair cycle starts over and you don't lose hair anymore. Gelenia. 0.5 milligram dose once a day. We measure just like with Obagio, we measure blood count, we measure liver enzymes. Um, the difference with Jelenia is that we worry a little bit more about your heart. So before you take the medication for the first time, we have to make sure that you have a normal EKG. If you're a smoker or if you have any underlying lung disease, we do some special breathing tests. Uh, that way, if you complain about shortness of breath later on, we have something to measure it against. Um, we check an antibody to the varicella virus or the virus that causes chicken pox because there were a couple of um, deaths related to that virus getting into your nervous system in the clinical trials. Um, so if you have never been exposed to that virus, we immunize you before we give you Jelenia. Um, and it's a pregnancy category C drug. Um, it is associated with something called uh, QT prolongation. So how many of you watch the, like, the medical shows on TV and you see like the thing like that that measures your heart? I can't draw it, but do you guys know what an EKG is? Yeah, right, okay. So sometimes um, parts of that EKG, they separate, and it suggests that the chambers of your heart aren't communicating well, and it's, it's a bad thing. And so we don't wanna put you on Jelenia with other drugs that can also make this happen. 
And then finally, we have our newest, our newest member of the group, dimethyl fumarate, uh, or Tecfidera. This drug is given twice a day. Um, the most common side effects are flushing, like a hot red facial flush. Um, any number of GI symptoms, um, diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, pain, hopefully all transient. Um, and we measure blood count and liver enzymes. And this is a category C drug. So you can see, um, I guess the point that I want to make is when you're, when you're thinking, you know, wow, I've been on this shot for a really long time. I'm OK. I'm taking it like it's prescribed. And it doesn't really hurt me. I'm interested in the oral drugs. You also have to think about the things that you're going to have to do um, and, and inevitably put up with, with newer drugs that we don't know as much about because they've only been around for three years instead of 20, right? That being said, we have so many more choices. So as a person, I'm going to move on to adherence, as a person taking an injectable therapy, which is all we had, who feels crappy because it's an interferon, excuse my French, um, who feels like, you know, is having more and more anxiety with every injection that they have to go give themselves, um, and eventually just moves those copaxone injections before they were three times a week to like, maybe I'm gonna do this on Monday, and then next week I'll think about it, and then the rebif shot starts to go down to once a week. It's really not helping your MS. So it's actually worth a whole lot to have a discussion about a newer therapy that you're going to buy into more. And so that brings me to adherence. Um, we used to word, use the word compliance. You know, I'm a nurse. We talk a lot about patients being compliant. And it sounds so mean. You know, it sounds like, oh, you guys, you're awful. You're not compliant, right? So, so compliance is the act of yielding to a wish, request, or demand. It's, it's kind of a lonely word, and it suggests that you're not really part of anything, that someone's like pounding something into you. So adherence is faithful attachment, the process of sticking to something, of sticking together. It's collaborative. And so we like to talk about adherence now, because when I choose, when I help you choose a disease-modifying therapy, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, what's working best for this person? What's working best for his or her day-to-day -day life, for his or her wallet, for his or her support system, and for his or her MS? So strict adherence to disease-modifying therapy results in optimal management of your, multi of your um, multiple sclerosis. We measure adherence by discontinuation rates. Usually these things are done by your insurance companies, and I'll tell you a sneaky secret. So about, I don't know, twice a week, I'll get this stack of papers from the fax machine from companies like Express Scripts and Medco, and they'll say things like, Mary Smith didn't fill her medication this month. This suggests she might be non-compliant. And so if it's, you know, if it's something like migraine medicine, I'm like, all right, Mary's headaches are better. But if it's something like Tecfidera or Jelenia, I'm thinking, what's Mary doing with her medicine? You know, I got to give Mary a call because clearly this isn't fitting into her life. So... Approximately 60 to 75% of people um, adhere to their interferon injections or their copaxone injections for about two to five years, right? That's not good. 60 to 75% after five years, what are you doing? You're just not taking your medicine anymore. Review of pharmacy database reveals 80% compliance with injectables. So 80%, that's a little bit better. But our ultimate goal is 100%. And most discontinuation of any medication for MS, now these studies were done in the era of injectables only, but most discontinuation occurs within the first two years. And there are a lot of reasons why. We don't educate you guys well about what the goals of treatment are. You guys have factors going on in your life, psychologically, socially, physically, financially, that affect your 
a desire to take medication, B, ability to take medication. And now it's becoming more and more difficult to access the healthcare system. You change your insurance plan, you can't see the neurologist that you were seeing for 10 years. You know, So it's becoming harder and harder to access and it's becoming more and more expensive. So understanding the disease. So I'm gonna tell you, um, you're newly diagnosed with MS. Uh, Walter, this is his support group, so he probably deals with this a lot. And I'm gonna say, you need to go on a disease-modifying therapy. You start taking it. You've been on it for about six months, and you're thinking, even though you've been back to see me, I'm giving myself a bad rap here. I, I'm hoping I don't usually do this. I'm hoping I don't do this at all. But you come back to see me, and you're like, well, I'm still tired. I still have urinary urgency, and I still can't move my right leg well. It gets really heavy. So this drug isn't working for me. So what that means is that I didn't do a good job of explaining to you that your disease-modifying therapy prevents you from having, from having relapses and from having um, increased lesions on MRI. Your disease-modifying therapy does not make your symptoms better. And that's one of the most common reasons why people discontinue their disease-modifying therapies, because they, they don't feel better. It's not like taking an antibiotic and your sinus infection goes away. So there's disease-modifying therapy, and then there's medicines or th different types of therapy to manage your symptoms. And so a lot of people say, well, if, if, I, um, if my symptoms aren't better, then my drug is failing, or even I'm failing. Um, and, and many people will say, well, I get this not infrequently, someone comes back to the office that hasn't been in for a while and, and you talk to them about whatever they're taking and they say, well, I'm not taking that anymore because I took it for like two weeks and I started to feel great, so I figured I didn't need it. Right, so, and, and people that have less severe symptoms in MS are actually more likely to stop taking their medication because they just kind of don't want to be reminded that they have something chronic going on. So psychosocial factors. How many of you have heard the term self-efficacy? Teaching you some great terms tonight. Self-efficacy is the ability to organize and implement a course of action. It's the ability to initiate a coping mechanism for something you don't wanna do, to persist in that behavior, and to set goals for yourself to encourage persistence. So this is a heavy duty word Adherence increases with self-efficacy. So the more likely you are to do things for yourself, to set goals, to have a positive attitude, the more likely you are to be adherent. Um, women and those with relapsing forms of MS tend to have greater self-efficacy. I don't know why. I could tell you a lot of reasons why women are more awesome than men. I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, and then, and then Dr. Kizrayan will come up here and tell you all the reasons why they're not, I'm sure. So, um, so women and those with um, relapsing MS, and you can, you can see that like if you have relapsing disease, then, then you might have fewer symptoms, and so maybe you feel more positive about what's going on with your MS. Fear of needles or injection anxiety is another psychosocial fact factor because you're doing something to yourself, if you can reframe that to doing something for yourself, it tends to help with adherence. And then cognitive dysfunction. So simply, a, a lot of people just forget. They forget to take their medicine, they forget to do their injection. And in fact, in a 2009 survey, 58% of people were non-adherent because they simply forgot. Depression, right, if you don't feel motivated, you might not do the thing, the very thing that you need to do. Um, a good analogy would be exercise, right? So we all know that we need to exercise, but when we feel a little bit blue, even though movement is gonna help us feel better, the last thing that we wanna do is get up and move, right? How many of you have experienced that? So depression can affect adherence. Lack of hope and faith, so a negative attitude instead of a positive attitude. Um, having a great social support network helps with adherence. You guys are here, you're talking to one another. I know how most of you sit um, at tables and I see some of you sitting with new people, which is awesome because you guys need each other. Life changes. 
role change, marriage, pregnancy, other illnesses, job loss, all of these things can make it difficult to adhere to your medication. And then how easy is your medicine to use? Was that a 10 minute warning? Five minute warning? Three minute warning? Okay. Whew. I'm glad I didn't drink that coffee after all. Um, physical factors, and, and I would say that this relates especially to injections, um, is that if your dominant hand is weak and uncoordinated, you're gonna have an awful hard time doing your injection. It's common sense. Um, if you don't have someone in the house to help you, if you have visual disturbance, you're gonna have a hard time organizing things to give yourself an injection. And then side effects or adverse events. So I read off that list of side effects. I read off that list of adverse events for all the medications. I'm not gonna talk about it again, but what I'll say is that with these medications, the requirement to access the healthcare system, see other specialists, get lab work done frequently, all of these things um, can, can make it hard for people to be adherent because they're just like, man, I spent all my time at doctors, I spent all my money on co-pays, and I don't want to go to the lab one more time. I'm not taking this medicine. So you can see that a lot goes into making a decision for a disease-modifying therapy. A lot goes into your head, a lot goes into my head. The good news is that ultimately, if your disease-modifying therapy isn't literally working for your MS, and we change you to a disease-modifying therapy with a different mechanism, chances are you're going to do better. The bad news is that we do not have any markers yet to be able to draw your blood and say, oh, this is the drug you should take. We don't know how to do that yet. And we hope that one day we'll be able to do that because how much better would all of you feel if I could say, this is the drug for your MS? right? You would all feel so much better. So cross our fingers, say our prayers. Um, accessing the healthcare system, and I'll end with that. How much trust do you have in your healthcare provider? If you don't believe what they're saying to you, if you think they're lying to you, if you don't think you can get their attention when you need it, you know, why would you do what they tell you to do? Why would you do what they ask of you? I could talk about the economy for hours, and I'm not, because people are looking at me funny from the back. Um, and then from my standpoint, um, adherence has a lot to do with risk management. Are you doing the things that you need to do to stay on these drugs safely? Because ultimately, um, I want you to have MS and have a long life. And that's it. I'm done. Oh my gosh, no I'm not. I'm just gonna go to this. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have time to talk about yoga, Stu. 30 seconds. Okay, yoga. We have three classes in Jacksonville. The third one started today at Embody Southside, 10 to 11 a.m. Like us on Facebook, OMS Yoga. All of the information is there. Um, you, can't, you can't read that. Um, next week, you can go to omsyoga.com. It might not be the most awesome website you've ever been to, but it'll get better. So thanks. Thank you, Megan Weigel. Weigel. So next we're gonna invite Dr. Ali Kasrayan, although if I said that wrong, he can recorrect me. And I could say he came all the way from the Middle East to see us, but that wouldn't be true. Hey everyone, how are you doing? So I'm told I gotta speak loud. I apologize for being late. I, I had a pretty relaxed operating room schedule that turned into emergency after emergency. And uh, so that's why I am in front of you in pajamas and not a suit, so I apologize. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is um, say that this is, th Stuart, thank you for inviting me again to do this. This was a wonderful thing last year, um, and I had a great time doing it. This year is a little bit more special for me because Megan, Dr. Weigel, and I have known each other since, God, freshman in college or something of that nature, and this is the first kind of pseudo-professional thing we've done um, in, in, in the medical world, and we actually, a couple of weeks ago, were on, the, on my radio show together. It's a show called The Conversation, the Saturdays on WOKV from 5 to 6 p.m., 
and uh, we got to talk about MS. And, and I encourage you to go to OMS Yoga. I mean, she's, one, she's incredibly passionate about it. Two, um, it's an amazing thing. And there's studies coming out now that have already been out, but now people are atten uh, paying attention to them, that things um, that yoga represents and the things that they do for, for people of all sorts of different disease processes or not even having them are, are uh, very, very helpful in both the physical realm, but also in the spiritual realm of dealing with things. Uh, she's always bugging me to do it, but um, my, my flaw that she keeps telling me is I don't make enough time to uh, do things other than work, so she's probably right on that. So pay attention to what Megan says. Um, one thing I want to talk about before we get started, um, this is an interesting disease process for us as urologists to deal with because um, most people that have MS at some point in their life have some degree of a urologic issue which mimic and are very similar to general urologic problems with urination that, that it, it forces us as urologists to be better in terms of the diagnostic acumen uh, and the diagnostic tools that we have to help us uh, give you the correct diagnosis. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those tools that we have today. Um, and I'll try to stay within the, the time constraints. I don't do well with punctuality and I'm, I'm long winded, so I'll do my best. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures in the world. That's my dad. I'm very blessed to work with my dad every day and I get to operate with him. And tomorrow we got two, three gigantic cases we get to do together, so I'm very excited. So uh, this is actually my first time in the operating room as a medical student. I was home for Christmas and he's like, I got some cases, do you wanna come? And so I got to operate and we took a kidney out together. So that's one of my favorite pictures. Um, I'm Ali. I'm, I'm, I'm a fellowship trained laparoscopic and robotic surgeon, so most of what I do is minimally invasive surgery for urologic cancers. Um, but one thing as urologists that we all do is diagnose difficulties with urination and, again, sexual issues that are related to many different disease processes. And today we'll specifically discuss them with regards to MS. So Megan probably went through this stuff a lot more eloquently than I did, but I'll make a feeble attempt at uh, giving some analogies or, or some ideas of what MS is. Um, to simplify things, you know, it's a demyelinating process, but if you think of uh, your nervous system as a series of, of wires, uh, and the myelin serves as, a, as, as the insulation. And so what, what, with MS, what happens is you have a, a process of, uh, that affects the insulation. Basically, your body affects the insulation, so it affects how the nervous system relays information through those wires and is inefficient. So some of the, the, the issues related to the symptoms and the signs that people experience with, with MS are related to that inefficient transference of that signal. Um, so uh, it's a disease that affects young and middle-aged people. It affects about one in a thousand Americans in, 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 northeast, uh, in, uh, in Northern Europe. It's a little bit more common and uh, it seems to favor women. Uh, however, when men get it, it's something for us to be mindful as well because we have to be mindful of the symptoms and, the, and, and some of the more severe things that, that go along with it at a little bit rapid, more rapid pace. Lesions that are known as plaque can range from different sizes, like we spoke about. Uh, the demyelination process is a big issue. And where those lesions are, are, are very important to us as urologists because the, the presentation of the urologic impact uh, and the urologic symptoms are different. So uh, autopsy studies have looked at the cervical spinal cord is very, very uh, prevalent in terms of demyelination with MS, but also the sacral and the lumbar spinal cords are also affected between 40 and 18 percent uh, respectively. So those are important things to think about. Thus, you know, when you look at that based on where those lesions are, it's not surprising that people can have difficulties with urination. Uh, the lumbar spine can have impacts. You know, when we we're med students, we learned S2, 3, and 4 keeps the bladder off the floor. Those are the sacral nerves, and we'll talk a little bit, uh, a little bit why those things are important in terms of where the lesions are. Um, you know, with MS, it's a, the, the disease and the dysfunction of the lower urinary tract is very variable. Uh, however, more than 80% of patients with MS and close to 96% of those who have disease more than 10 years will have some form of a urinary tract issue with the most common thing that we see as urologists being detrusor overactivity or basically an overactive bladder. You can have irritative symptoms, which are basically, I'm going all the time 
frequency. I get an urge to go and I can't race to the bathroom. I can't get there fast enough. You can have pain. You can wake up at night frequently. All of these are very similar to anyone that would have a urinary tract infection. So when, when you see a urologist or call Megan, they say drop off a lab is because we don't want to start treating your MS if it's just a simple urinary tract infection and vice versa. You can have obstructive symptoms, weak interrupted stream, uh, start or stop, you have to strain to push, sometimes you feel like you're not getting everything out. Men with an enlarged prostate could have very similar symptoms. Women with a narrowing of their urine channel can have very similar symptoms. And then there are, the, the, there are various different forms of urinary incontinence. Uh, urinary incontinence is, is, a, is a very interesting diagnostic uh, uh, dilemma sometimes because it could be a mixed incontinence, which is a combination of all those things. Stress incontinence is basically coughing, sneezing, lifting, uh, and that causes a, a leakage most commonly in the United States. It's related to, to multiple childbirths and things of that nature, um, and, and just a weakening of the pelvic floor. Urge incontinence is related to overactive bladder uh, uh, processes, which basically your bladder has an uninhibited contraction of the muscle that uh, your, your body cannot keep uh, the urge to go to the bathroom at bay and sometimes you can't get to the bathroom fast enough. Uh, overflow incontinence is whenever your bladder doesn't empty all the way and so you're, you're retaining urine and so just the sheer weight of the volume of urine that you're not emptying overrides your sphincter's capacity to hold it. And again, like I said before, you can have mixed incontinence. So this is very important in terms of where the lesions are. Again, the sacrum is down here. Uh, we'll talk about some very interesting surgical techniques we can do to help with overactive bladder in terms of neuromodulation techniques that, that focus on, on the relationship between the sacral spine and uh, the, the, the message your brain receives in terms of your urination pathways. Um, so you can have suprasacral uh, issues or you can have sacral cord events. And, and so those present potentially differently in terms of uh, your urologic symptoms. Suprasacral cord events, basically these are lesions in, in the area of the spinal cord or above that sacral area. Cervical cord plaques can occur in up to 80% of MS patients. Um, and, and so some of these lesions relate to the, the, to the relay of messages or the, re, or the lack of inhibition of certain sing, signals for the, for the bladder's overactive uh, symptomatology. So basically your bladder is shooting off rapid and uninhibited contractions and your, your mind's control mechanisms that usually shut those off are, are not suppressed anymore. So patients with MS lack the suppression of this autonomous or uninhibited bladder contracture, which relates to an overactive bladder. Urgency, frequency, and sometimes urge incontinence. Spinal lesions may also disrupt the pathways that allow the synergy between your bladder and your sphincter. So uh, a very simple way to look at this is your bladder does two things. It fills and it empties. And your sphincter is supposed to be a very, very, symbi a very uh, synergistic in terms of when it's closing and when it's opening to help you store urine and empty urine. So basically, when your bladder's filling, your sphincter should be tight. When your bladder's emptying and the bladder squeezes, it, your sphincter should relax so that you're able to get the urine out uh, efficiently. And sometimes along these pathways, you can have a disrupted signal leading to a process known as uh, detrusor sphincter dyssinergia, which is basically the detrusor muscle is the muscle of your bladder. So your bladder muscle squeezes and at the same time your sphincter squeezes, so it's dyssinergic. You can also have incomplete sphincteric relaxation. So the sphincter just doesn't relax to so allow uh, a, a, an easy outflow. And sometimes the sphincter can be paralyzed, so that would cause uh, leakage and things of that nature. So all of these pathways can come into play uh, either uh, alone or all together. So, so your uh, urologists have the tools that allow us to do some elegant diagnostics to, to, to personalize what's going on to your bladder and how it, it affects you. So, Personalized care, you know, it's, it's a term that's going around a lot for, for various different things. I do a lot with prostate cancer. Everyone's talking about personalizing care. Uh, it's all over the, the media, but it's really an important factor in terms of dealing with any disease process because uh, your disease is only one part of who you are. And so some of the things Megan was talking about earlier in terms of how you deal with it um, are very important. I myself, I'm a diabetic. I've had it since I was a kid. I never let it, uh, honestly, like it's tougher for me to remember to shave and obviously to get dressed in the morning. Um, uh, you know, I've played in bands, I've played sports and things of that nature. It just in my mind, it wasn't something that I saw as that big of a deal. And so with some of these things, 
the challenge of the why is this happening um, can be very effectively uh, uh, dealt with in terms of good diagnostics. And, and in urology, fortunately, we're able to do that with some of the urologic symptomatology that, that people with MS sometimes undergo and deal with. So with the sacral cord, which is a little bit lower, the, the opposite problem happens. The plaques in these pathways may inhibit the bladder's ability to contract. So we were talking earlier about a bladder doing two things, filling and emptying. Over here, people with these lesions have a bladder that does a magnificent job of filling. It just doesn't do quite as effective job of emptying. So it, it creates urinary retention. So you're not emptying all the way. So these lower, lower motor neuron lesions related to the demyelination of that sacral cord we, thought we spoke about can cause detrusor hypercontractility and detrusor areflexia. Basically, the bladder muscle just doesn't squeeze as efficiently as it used to. And that prevents you from being able to empty all the way. So, you know, and Megan went through a lot of this stuff as well, you know, from the, from the moments that I got here and was able to listen. But in terms of, you know, the, the clinical presentation of MS in general is basically multiple event, events, uh, space through time and, and location. And, and uh, they're separated by at least a month. They ref reflect distinct ana anatomic regions of, the, of your central nervous system. And uh, they can be relapsing and remitting. So they wax and wane. Urologically, only about two and a half percent of patients with MS present with their initial symptoms being urologic. Um, however, uh, like we spoke about before, urologic issues do affect people with MS and patients uh, who are dealing with what seem like very simple uh, general symptoms, uh, they can occur and, uh, and, 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 it's, and it's frustrating. However, knowing that you can talk to your doctor, you can talk to your urologist to come up with, it, with uh, an evaluation to make sure that this isn't a, just a urinary tract infection, or maybe it just is. It allows you to be able to not allow um, everything to be kind of loopholed into being an MS issue. Or if it is, we can find things that we do to help it. Um, so the management of, of MS is a multidisciplinary process. And with the fact that urologic issues can come to the forefront in, in, in a, a large percentage of, of people who have this disease, it's very important that the neurologists and the urologists work together to, to one, find some of these diagnoses and then come up with a, with a coherent team-based plan on figuring out what to do to make sure that this doesn't affect you or bother you as much as it, it sometimes does. You know, most people don't think about their urination until you have a lot of trouble urinating, whether you're not emptying or going all the time or you're having leakage issues. It really, really becomes a big deal and it affects people tremendously in terms of their quality of life. And that's one of the nice things about urology is that we get to um, not only deal with cancers and things of that nature, but we can step in and help uh, figure out ways to improve a quality of life with usually fairly simple things. Um, when, when you talk in terms of the history, we spoke about those irritative symptoms, we spoke about the obstructive symptoms, which can happen in up to 85% of the presentations. Urinary incontinence can ha happen up to 72% of the time, and then urinary retention, about 50%. So all of these things are things that we look at. When you come to a urologist's office, we get a urine sample, we ask you some questions about how you're urinating, we make sure that we get an assessment of the flow of your urination to give us an idea of how your stream is, we make sure that your bladder is emptying all the way, and all that stuff with it, it very in a very minimally invasive manner can give us some information that is very, very helpful. Um, in terms of our physical examination, you do pay a lot of attention to lower extremity issues uh, because especially motor dysfunction uh, it has been usually a very good predictor of urologic and bladder dysfunction that may be related to MS. And usually these are associated with pyramidal uh, dysfunction issues. The workup imaging has really changed. Uh, the way we diagnose MS and some of the new criteria allow for an earlier diagnosis, so the impact of the disease may be more proactively addressed as opposed to uh, retroactively dealt with, which I think is very, very good. As a urolo urologist, you know, we allow the symptomatology and what's going on with you is, uh, from a urologic standpoint to guide to where we guide where we go with the imaging, because fortunately, upper tract kidney dysfunction is fairly rare with MS. However, if you, if you show up with blood in your urine, we'd get the same kind of imaging we would do if you had blood in your urine. So it allows to us to guide a very efficient uh, evaluation. But fortunately, upper tract disease with, with the kidney affect less than 1% of people with MS. 
the hallmark, in my opinion, of, of, uh, of diagnosing urinary dysfunction and voiding difficulties, regardless of what the cause of it is, uh, is your dynamics evaluation in the right setting in my eyes. This is a very elegant test, and I'll come back to this slide, but I'll show you here. It's basically a test here where you use very small catheters that are really about the size of a tip of a pen to gently fill the bladder and see when do you feel full? When do you get that urge? When would you pull the car over and run out in the hills? Then when your bladder feels full, we get you to urinate and we measure the force of your stream and also the amount of pressure your bladder generates to create that stream. And based on that, we can figure out, is this a bladder issue? In men, is this a prostate issue? Or in women, is it an outlet obstruction issue? What's the issue? And, and so with this, instead of, you know, in, in our clinics, we, we have closet full of samples of overactive bladder medications. We could spend years trying one for one month, it didn't work, come back, let's try this. In my opinion, finding out the why is the essence of, of medicine and, 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 the diagno and, and, and finding that diagnosis of what's going on. And so with this, we have a very elegant test that gives us the why. And with the why, we can do a lot, as we'll talk about, there are various different medications and things of that that you can use depending on what the symptoms are. Um, this allows you to uh, identify the proper issues relating to the bladder, what's going on with the sphincter, is there an obstruction, and it allows us to be m more precise and personalized in both the diagnosis and the ultimate management of what's going on with the, with the urination and the urologic symptoms. Um, and again, the incidence of abnormal urodynamics finding in MS may be as high as 100%. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're severe, but it's worth pursuing if you're having recurrent issues with urination, especially if they're affecting your quality of life. Without urodynamics, some studies have shown that up to 73% of people um, followed, at least for a little bit of time, uh, a treatment paradigm that wasn't really well matched to the diagnosis that ultimately came from the appropriate workup. And so that's the machine. Basically, what a urodynamic study looks like is this. Uh, you have one line that looks at what the bladder muscle's doing. You have a line that looks at, 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 at what the, uh, uh, the, the force of your stream's doing. You look at what the sphincter's doing. And with some elegant computer uh, uh, software to, and, and, and math, um, math's always involved in everything, it seems like. Um, I don't use any algebra. I, I would, it, what, one thing that's funny, not to tangentialize with a ridiculous story, but when I was growing up, my dad was the smartest guy in terms of math ever. I would show up and doing like derivatives or something crazy, and he'd pop in in two minutes, do the whole you know, problem, and everything would be fine. I'm afraid like when, when my kids started coming up and talking about doing those things, I'm going to have to go to school so I don't seem in, uh, unintelligent when, when they ask me these questions. My dad, it was like nothing. Physics, we're, we're, we're solving crazy things, building experiments. So I don't know how he does that, but math's important. It's not the theme of today's talk, but nonetheless. So basically what we do is we use the, the, the tracings and the, and, and the findings of the urodynamics to give us an idea of what along the various different uh, cascade and uh, the, the, the realm of, of, of uh, diagnoses that we have to find out exactly what's going on with your urination. So what do we do with it? You know, we've, we've done all this crazy diagnostics and we found out that you have X. What do we do with it? So. To, to look at this, we kind of break it down into bladder, bladder storage issues and bladder emptying issues. That should kind of make things simple. And, and that's the way I kind of learn. You build, you know, you create building blocks uh, to, to, uh, on top of simplicity as opposed to making things complex and confusing everyone. Um, so we, we spoke earlier about overactive uh, bladder issues. And again, detrusor hyperactivity, detrusor instability. Basically, it means that your detrusor muscle uh, is, is contracting with, without inhibition. And so it's creating the symptoms of, of frequency, urgency. You can have urge incontinence. If it happens at night, you're waking up a lot at night. And so the first line tends to be medicinal. Although I encourage thinking about, um, you know, they talk about it in terms of biofeedback, but looking at various different things. I always have my patients do a bladder diet. You basically take, uh, um, we have this book, it's filled with cartoons talking about bladder things, so it's, it's an easy read, but it's got three or four pages um, within it that begin the process of what's called a bladder diary. You spend three days answering questions like, did you have to go? How often? What did you drink before? Did you have to rush? And things of that nature. And then when we come to clinic, we sit down and really go over it and see how is this affecting you. And you'd be surprised. Sometimes, you know, there are things going on that we don't pay attention to unless we actually pay attention to them. I had a guy a couple of weeks ago came in and he's going all the time. It's really bothered, uh, really bothering him and affecting him at work. And when we looked at what he was doing, he was drinking uh, three and a half liters of Mountain Dew a day. <laughs> and so Mountain Dew... 
I've never enjoyed it very much, but nonetheless, it has an a, a, a incredible amount of caffeine in it. So caffeine irritates the bladder, makes you feel like you have to go more often. Um, and it's three and a half liters of a carbonated beverage. And Megan drinks a lot of coffee. I almost pointed it, so if I got someone's eyes, I'm sorry. Um, um, so with, with this, if you look at things that you're doing that may be affecting your urination, it's an important thing to look at regardless of what those diagnoses are. But let's say you have an overactive bladder and you like a lot of ca caffeine. Uh, that's going to be an issue. So we look at behavior modification and things of that nature uh, that may become a very important thing. If, if stress incontinence, coughing, sneezing, leaking becomes an issue, Kegel exercises are very important because what you're doing is you're strengthening the sphincter mechanism and your pelvic floor. And the way to do that is basically the next time you go urinate, try to stop your stream. Remember what that feels like and then do it at other times. By no means do it consistently when you're urinating because you'll create that detrusor sphincter dysinergia. It's called avoiding dysfunction. Uh, so basically when your bladder is squeezing your, your sphincter mechanism and your pelvic floor are tight, we don't want to do that. But you can do those exercises. You know, if you watch a half an hour TV show, there are three commercials. Do about three to five every time the commercials come on. And then when you feel a, a, a cough or a sneeze coming on, do the Kegel exercises or Kegel exercises, I'm told, is the proper pronunciation, but doesn't sound as good. Um, so after that, the next thing that we do are medications. Medications, there, there, there are two classes. Historically, they were anticholinergic. So anyone that, that has had overactive bladder for a while may have been on Ditropan or Oxybutynin, Detrol, uh, Vesicare, Sanctura, um, Enablex. If I forgot them, I'm sure the rep will be in my office tomorrow saying, why aren't you using our med? Toviaz. Um, so all these different medications, they work on inhibiting, and we'll talk about it. So these basically inhibit the binding of acetylcholine to the muscarinic receptor. A lot of mumbo jumbo saying that it basically in, it inhibits the bladder's uh, uninhibited contraction. So basically it suppresses that involuntary bladder contraction. It allows you to have an increase in bladder volume so you're holding more, so you don't have to go as frequently. And thereby uh, it decreases how frequently and urgently you go by inhibiting that uninhibited contracture. Or, or, or uninhibiting that uninhibited contracture. Uh, approximately 60 to, uh, 67 to 80 percent of uh, MS patients respond to this medication, but there's a high dropout rate because of the side effects. Dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision are the most common that we see, so people stop them. Um, and again, the initial management is usually with medications that allow us to inhibit those uninhibited contractions uh, of the bladder and or to increase storage. So a new medication recently came out. It's called Mirabetric or, or Mirabegron, and it's a beta-3 adrenergic agonist. So what does that mean? So this allows the bladder to hold more without inhibiting its ability to squeeze. So this becomes very important because it allows you to have increased bladder capacity and causes a relaxation of the muscle, but when you need to urinate, the bladder muscle still squeezes. Um, and that's a vast oversimplification, but it's a very elegant drug, especially with men with big prostates that aren't that big that we need to go do a surgical procedure to open the prostate channel up. But it allows us to give a medicine that relaxes the bladder and also another medicine to allow us to, to, to relax the prostate. And so you can deal with both problems at once. And for both men and women, it's a great drug. Um, after about four weeks of taking it, as I'll show in some studies, there was a noticed decrease in urgency and urge incontinence. Uh, and uh, in about eight weeks, people noticed that they weren't going as frequently. And it's a great drug with very, very minimal uh, side effects that has been shown. Again, it increased the volume that people were urinating every time. And it also decreased the amount of incontinence episode and frequency per a 12-hour period in comparison to placebo at week four. Um, and I'll show you a graph that kind of shows that a little bit. Uh, side effects, most of them are less than 5%. Headaches, some people get headaches. Some people can get a little bit of an upper respiratory kind of congested feeling. It's called nasopharyngitis. You can have high blood pressure. That becomes important. I generally ask my patients to check their blood pressure once a day when starting this medication um, because if the top number, what's called a systolic blood pressure, gets above 180 consistently, then I'd recommend stopping the medication. Another thing we have to look at is, is if anyone's on a medicine called metoprolol, which you take to relax, to, to kind of slow the heart, or, or some people take it for blood pressure issues, um, the dosing of that needs to be adjusted based on, on this medication's introduction into your medication profile. Um, some people can, can get urinary tract infections, and also some people can get uh, urinary retention, but that's incredibly rare, which is good news, which is good news. 
This is one of the big trials that came out from uh, this, this gentleman called Vic Nitti, who actually had on my radio show uh, several weeks ago. It was a great talk about uh, uh, urinary incontinence. And, and he's, he's one of the thought leaders in, in, in the world of female urology. And so if anyone wants to podcast it, it's, it's, it, it was a very insightful conversation because he's one of the world's leaders in terms of these fields. So basically, in this study, they found you can see at four weeks in comparison to placebo, which is this, the doses that they used, again, they use 150. Uh, in the U.S., the maximum dose is 50 milligrams. But you can see at week four, the amount of frequency and urgency decreased. So it was, and, and, it, and it continued to decrease uh, until it stabilized between 8 to 12 weeks. So for me, this has been an amazing medication that, that has, a, has it really positively helped a lot of people with overactive bladder symptoms that um, they were not tolerant of the other medications. And so with this, uh, it's a very, very beautiful drug. So we spoke about the medications. The next thing that's relatively new over the past half decade or so is the introduction of, of Botox. In, in refractory overactive bladder, meaning that you're taking the medications, you're still going frequently, you're still going urgently, and nothing seems to work. What you can do is go and take a, a botulinum toxin and inject it through a cystoscopic procedure where you go into the bladder with a telescopic camera, again, about the size of the, the back tip of the pen, not the writing pit tip of the pen. And you go in there and you basically introduce small amounts of uh, Botox, same type of stuff that people put into their face for, for cosmetic reasons. It's a muscle relaxant. So it, it offers paralysis uh, focally to these different areas. And again, that flaccid paralysis of the skeletal muscle by, by uh, blocking the, uh, the specific nerve pathways here allow for improvements in those symptomatology. And the first time it was uh, reported in the, in the urinary system was uh, 1987 when it was ex um, injected in the external sphincter uh, to treat that detrusor sphincter uh, external uh, dyssynergia that we spoke about. Um, um, before. Uh, it treats overactive bladder and it's, and it's a unique mechanism and, and, and it's got about uh, a six month duration depend, uh, of, of durable result. It is something that wears off and you have to do it again, um, but it's a minimally invasive procedure and for some people it helps quite a bit. Um, I got 10 minutes, so I got a, we got a whole bunch of stuff up. I'm going to go a little faster if I'm not blazing in terms of the speed with which I speak already. So Botox, 73% of people were continent at 12 weeks, and that continence persisted in, the, in this study, which was a big study out of uh, New England Journal of Medicine about a decade ago. Um, and 28% of people uh, had discontinued an anticholinergics after getting the, the Botox, and 72% uh, uh, of people had decreased the, the use of them. So it was very important in terms of how this can help people where the other medicines may not have. Adverse effects, some people have pain. And most of these side effects are related to the procedure, not necessarily the Botox. So pain, you can have a urinary tract infection, you can, uh, you can have uh, blood in the urine. Some people can have urinary retention. This is about a six to 16% risk uh, uh, of having issues with not being able to empty. So one thing that's very important anytime you inject Botox is that the person that's undergoing the procedure should have the capacity of performing in and out self catheterization if needed. Because that, that is a, it is a price, it's a small risk, but one that is, is possible in that you're going and purposefully inhibiting uh, the, the bladder's ability to contract. So overactive bladder can be a difficult condition to treat. And sometimes uh, there, there are limited options for people where medications have failed. Uh, so Botox is one that, that allows us another option that's minimally invasive with about six months or so of, of durable result uh, that, that really can help people quite a bit. Another option that's very, very helpful is, is the option of, and, and consideration of what's called neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is basically um, putting an electrical lead and a stimulation into the S3 foramen, uh, like we talked about S2, 3, and 4, it keeps the bladder off the floor. And basically what that does, is it changes the pathway and, and, and the way those signals are received by the brain to inhibit those uninhibited contractions. And it has very, very good success rates for what's called refractory overactive bladder symptoms, um, where people, the medicines, and various different things have not helped. It is a permanent implant, and in 2014, you can't get an MRI except an MRI of the head with that. But it, it's in the pipe works. Uh, they're, they're doing very aggressive research and finding a uh, stimulator and a battery device that is MRI friendly, which will be important. If someone doesn't, doesn't want to undergo a procedure, again, this 
92% success, you know, most of the studies look in the 80s to 90s in terms of this being successful in a neurologically associated overactivity of the bladder. If you don't want to undergo a surgical procedure, there's a, a, a cousin of uh, inner stem, which is the thing we were speaking about before, called a, a percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation or a posterior tibial nerve stimulation, where basically you have a small acupuncture needle that you have placed in your doctor's office. It's a 30-minute visit of neurostimulation. It lasts about 12 weeks, and then if you have symptoms that, that come back, you come back and get shorter kind of booster segments. And this is not quite as successful as Interstim, but it's a nice segue for someone who doesn't want to undergo a permanent procedure. If you're not emptying your bladder, unfortunately, we don't have as good of, of, of options. Most of them result in some kind of catheterization, which again, clean intermittent catheterization where you catheterize yourself between four to eight hours, depending on how much you're holding, um, is an important factor because the risk of cath you know, like an infection with catheterization is far outweighed with the risk of holding too much urine both in terms of infections, bladder stones, kidney dysfunction over time, incontinence, all those things are big factors to think about. And again, you can become progressively more aggressive in terms of the surgical approaches to it. But, but these are the hallmark catheterization techniques of a bladder that's not completely emptying. Although inner stem, if you have non-obstructive non urinary retention, meaning that you're not emptying your bladder and there's no source of blockage, uh, has about a 50% success rate. All right, so we'll go through this quickly, um, and, and I'll try to speak fast. But sexual dysfunction is also a very important uh, thing for all of us. But, but with MS, it also is a very important thing because it can affect up to 91% or 72% of women, and um, it, activity either ceases or becomes unsatisfactory in a significant amount of people. And as a urologist who um, we have men or women talking to us about sexual issues all the time, this is an important thing to, to bring to the forefront when you're having discussions with your physicians because it is important to talk about and there are things that we can do. Um, and it affects your relationships. And, and, and so be open to talk about it and talk to your physicians about it. Um, and people want to remain sexually active. And, and so, but whether they're women or men, it's important to bring up these issues because there are things that we can, we can do about them. You know, most of the, the issues with, with women and sexual dysfunction with MS are fatigue, decreased sensation, anorgasmia, or a decreased sensation of orgasm or completely absent orgasm, and then difficulty with arousal. And, and so, um, you know, and, and a complaint that kind of plays along with that is, 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 is lubrication issues. So those things are things that we can, we can begin to prevent. Although, you know, the world of female sexual dysfunction, which affects in, in the general population more, more women than men, it's just we have Viagra, so there are TV commercials for it, so you hear about it more. And every guy that comes into a urologist's office for any reason asks you on the way out, it's like, hey, by the way. And then so I actually sit down, <laughs> it's true, it's true. And then they did all those low T commercials, and so now they're talking about that too. And um, I remember one day I was sitting in clinic, and sorry, sorry to be long, Stuart, last joke, I think. Um, uh, and all these guys all of a sudden, all week, come asking my testosterone level this. I'm like, well, how are these people becoming so astute in hypogonadism? So as I was leaving that day, I went out in my waiting room, and someone had put like low T pamphlets from every, every testosterone supplement known to man. But there are important things to talk about. Um, vaginal lubricants, vibratory stimulation, counseling, all these things are very important thing. Again, again, with the counseling, you know, I think it's important to talk about things that are bothering you. And, and sexual dysfunction is a very challenging thing to talk about. So I, a lot of times, initiate the conversation with my patients because, um, one, it's not something they re readily want to talk about unless they're asking for Viagra. And then, two, sometimes, <laughs> Sometimes there's this feeling of hopelessness that there's nothing that can be done, and that's not necessarily true. There's a lot going into the, the, the world of female sexual dysfunction is, is, is one that's been studied very, it's being studied very aggressively because we don't have too many answers, but we're looking to find them, you know, and, and looking at the hormonal milieu and the various different things that we can look at to help with that. Um, ED. Uh, multifactorial, again, for me, if someone has erectile dysfunction, I do begin a workup of finding out whether it's a testosterone issue. Sometimes it's the first sign of a cardiovascular disease. It can be related to neurologic issue. Uh, does someone have undiagnosed di di diabetes or something of that nature that's been going on for a while and guys don't go to the doctor, so maybe this is the first person that they're coming to see. Um, if it's psychological, 
that's something that needs to be addressed because everything really does start with the, with the mind. The way an erection works is your mind's aroused, a bunch of stuff happens culminating in the release of nitrous oxide from the blood vessels of the penis. Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Staxin, Stendra, all these things are, are medicines that break the, prevent the breakdown of nitrous oxide. So unless the mind is aroused, you can take all the Viagra known to man, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna help. So that's a very important thing to look at. In terms of treatment options, we have the oral medications. We have vacuum erectile dysfunction, uh, erectile devices, which are very, very helpful. Uh, Muse, which is basically a small suppository you put into the penis. Um, intracavernosal injection therapy. Uh, TV commercials and radio talk about if everything's failed you, I have the solution. We, you walk out of the office with an erection. That's injection therapy. <laughs> And we, we, every urologist has a story of a guy who came in, God's like, can I go home with this? And they get pulled over and the cop's like, what's going on? <laughs> but these things can potentially cause priapism, an erection more than four hours. So, so uh, it, it seems like it's a joke and it's great, but it's kind of like putting tourniquet around your arm. So if that happens, go to the emergency room. Uh, penile prosthesis. It's a surgical procedure where you implant a device that has a pump in, that's implanted in the scrotum and pontoons in the portion of the penis that causes erections. And so basically you can control your erection. And, and, and so for some people that all of these options did not work, this is a very, very successful and a minimally invasive procedure. So these are all the different medications that are out there. Stendra, Stendra just recently came out. Uh, it's supposed to act faster. Staxin is the same thing as Levitra, but you put it on your tongue and it dissolves. Cialis supposedly lasts a little bit longer in terms of staying in your system. It's half-life's longer, so that's why they call it the weekender. And Viagra is the first one. <laughs> and Viagra was the first one. Viagra was the first one, and what's interesting about Viagra, Viagra was actually in initially being researched as a blood pressure medication. And the subjects came back, it's like, I have no idea what's going on with my blood pressure, but my erections are much better. So, <laughs> so, so Pfizer changed the tune of their research, and they're, 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 they're much happier for it from a financial standpoint. These are the first line treatments. Be mindful if you're taking nitrates. Nitrates are, are what you take if you have chest pain and it relaxes the blood vessels of the, of the, of the heart to help prevent the, the, uh, the chest pain um, and, and the potential myocardial infarction. Um, nitrates combined with these medications can potentially lead to severe and detrimental hypotension. So your blood pressure drops significantly. So the TV commercials are true. Um, TV commercials. I don't know who on earth takes any medicines that advertise because uh, two minutes, two minutes. Um, they spend one minute talking about how fantastic it is and all the people are running around smiling while they're telling them that all the bad things that are going to happen to them when they take it. So I don't know who is going to do that. So basically, uh, those medicines are good. Things to be mindful of. You want to make sure that you do not take them if you have a very low blood pressure, you have a very high blood pressure, you're at an intermediate or high risk of a cardiovascular disease, meaning that you're gonna have heart attack or stroke based on your risk factors. Um, so, so talk to your primary doctor. When you talk to your urologist, we ask you these questions. And then if you've had a stroke, a heart attack, or a change in your ry heart rhythm over the past six months may not be the greatest of times to begin a medicine like this. Um, uh, 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 Megan spoke about QT interval prolongation. Levitra can potentially do that. Um, and common side effects, headache. Some people feel, like, feel flush. They may feel like they have a headache that is related to the fact that their head's about to explode. Some people get a bluish tint in their vision. It's because uh, the retina has PDE4 inhibitors and the penis has PDE5 inhibitors. So they cross-reference the pup. Some people get a, a, a bluish tint in their vision. Some people can feel congested. You can get back pain and, and muscle aches. Some people uh, can get priapism, having an erection more than four hours. So, uh, and some people can get heartburn. So it's a very important thing to be mindful of that. Erectile dysfunction is multifactorial. It impacts the well-being and the quality of life. Same as female sexual dysfunction affects the, 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 uh, the women. And, and these things affect the couples. And so improving these things can, may result in a better quality of life. And the last couple slides, MS is a devastating disease, but it's not beyond uh, being able to be dealt with. And, and there are doctors who care about this disease and people that can do that. So. Um, this was a really elegant slide and they ruined everything. No, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, so thank you guys for having me on here. If you guys have any questions about these things, um, 
Go to the radio show. Saturdays at 5, not 6 like a sub there. Thank you. That was great. By the way, whoever wants to listen to that penile comedy afterwards, all you have to do is go to watch it on YouTube and listen to all of his, you know, four-hour, five-hour weekend ordeal. I also would like to say that there's currently a drug in, in uh, phase two clinical trials that's in the same class as Viagra and Cialis and Levitra as a disease-modifying therapy. <laughs> yeah. So we shall see. See how many Any get to volunteers? using that, right? All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around the room. Who wants to raise their hand and make me run so that way we can get this started? I see a question right there. Yeah, yeah you. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I was just going to say the Kegel exercises are fabulous, and I haven't had any problems with any urinary stuff since the Kegel exercises. I'll tell you, the, the, it's, it's like you're training. I mean, it's really you're strengthening the muscle of, of, of the pelvic floor and the, specifically the muscle that, that honestly, if, if someone needs to go urinate or pass gas and I'm babbling on and there's no end in sight and Stuart's blocking the door, Kegel exercises are what you're doing to kind of hold everything. And the thing that's very important with that is that the key to continence in terms of stress incontinence is a, is a co-apted resting sphincter tone, meaning that when you're at rest, your sphincter is tight. Uh, this becomes important when people who have had prostatectomies. We're very aggressive in pelvic floor rehabilitation. I send people to a physical therapist that focuses on that before surgery, and then we continue for a short period of time after surgery to help them get their continence back quicker. And we find that by about three months to six months, people are at a pad, and from six months to a year, our goal becomes leak-free, pad-free. But if you're having small amount of incontinence, it's a great time to start Kegel exercises and behavior modification because you can prevent it from becoming a bigger deal. And have used it since then, and my kids are in their 20s. It's a good thing to teach, and then there's another thing. There are apps now for it, so you can take care. Another thing that I'll put out there that we get this all the time where generations of people and grandmas coming in for her urodynamics test, and I, this literally happened. It was about six months ago. It was grandma, mom, and two daughters of, you know, one was like 18, one was like 24, and she had a, a voiding dysfunction that looked like uh, detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. So basically, her bladder muscle tightened and her sphincter tightened, but the only difference is her abdomen was trying to strain. And so I went in there and asked him, do you guys squat to urinate? And all of them with pride said, yes, grandma taught us all. We've been squatting since we were kids and we don't want to touch anything. Horrific thing to do, don't do it. Absolutely don't do it because what you're doing is you're, you're creating a tense pelvic floor when you're urinating and you essentially create the same scenario as a disuse of sphincter dysynergia. Okay, we have a question over here. Um, this for Dr. Kessarian, um, if you've had a if you've had a bladder tuck or a bladder lift years ago and didn't know you had MS at the time, how likely is it that you will have that problem again? And if it's related to the MS or is it just related to the fact that it didn't last? That's a great question. So uh, pre-diagnosis, someone has stress urinary incontinence. And, and has a sling procedure for incontinence or a drop in the bladder, what's called prolapse, and they have a procedure that brings everything back to its normal anatomy. So what that tries to do is reconstitute the normal anatomy so that you void without incontinence or without what, whatever was the issue that was, that was bothering you when the bladder was dropped. That shouldn't inherently cause a new problem related to if you didn't have this, your MS wouldn't have been better. What's the challenge with MS with regards to your urination symptomatology is that MS is a dynamic process. So, so during the course of, of, of your life, you may have different varying degrees of MS depending on where the plaques are and various things of that nature. So whether or not it's impacted by that really depends on what the, the, the progression of the urologic issues are. Good. We're doing good here. Got to get me back there, too. Um, hello, Megan. You uh, mentioned um, a fairly high uh, percentage of people that have uh, um, secondary, relapse, uh, uh, secondary relapsing MS, secondary progressing to pr secondary progressive. Okay. I also just read an article about statins uh, delaying uh, this onset. Have you run into that or any yeah, information? So, so the old epidemiological studies um, tell us that within about 10 years of diagnosis, 50% of people that have relapsing, remitting MS will progress to secondary progressive MS. And that can still be with relapses. 
Those, that, those numbers are based on studies that started in the 60s, and so there were no treatments then. So I think what we're seeing in clinical practice now is that that is very delayed. The progression to secondary progressive MS is very delayed. Um, the question about statins, there are some phase two and some phase three um, clinical trials that have shown that statins may delay some parts of MS, be it relapse rate or MRI burden of disease or progression of disability. The numbers aren't great enough yet, however, for us to recommend a statin to everyone. So the general recommendation is that if you have MS and you have high cholesterol, you should be on a statin if you can tolerate them. But not everyone with MS at this point needs to be on a statin drug. Statins are for high cholesterol, by the way, like Lipitor, um, Pravacol, those drugs. I have two questions. One, Megan, with regards to smoking, uh, that percentage you mentioned was like 50% of MS was attributable to smoking. What about secondhand smoke? Was that part of that study or finding? most of the stuff? I can I can actually get you off the top of my head. I don't know that, but I can get it to you in five minutes. Um, but most of these studies are people that are actually smoking themselves. Okay. And it's not, again, it's not a cause, just an associative factor. Okay. And Camper, huh? Ali. Dr. K. Uh, <laughs> that's my dad. <laughs> um, with respect to uh, MRIs on your areas to find if you have any uro uro urological issues, is that, is that something that has to be focused directly on that directly on that area, or that comes from other MRIs? No, that's a good or question. So, so with regards to you know, when we as urologists do MRI scans, uh, a lot of time it's the abdomen and pelvis. That's where our neighborhood. That's where we live. Uh, however. Um, when I get urodynamic studies that find neurologically based diseases like detrusor sphincter dyssinergia, uh, one, I ask if the person has had any kind of neurologic issues in the past. You kind of know that because when, they, when you first met them, they give you a history of physical. Then I do a full neurologic exam. So I can find out if there's anything new going on uh, that they may not notice. Is there any weakness? Is there any kind of uh, numbness that they, they didn't neglect it to tell me or something of that nature? With regards to the MRI, if they haven't had one and I see something in the physical exam that, that leads me to think that may be worthwhile doing, I get an MRI of the lumbar spine. A lot of times I try to get the thoracic spine, but I have to fight with the insurance company uh, to do that a lot of times. Um, so, so for us, it's kind of looking to see if there's in there. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is for me, it's more of a, a, a diagnosis of discovery so that I can get someone to a neurologist if they need them from that standpoint. So uh, when, when I do the MRI of the pelvis, I'm looking for different things than if I'm looking at the MRI of the spine. Question back here. By the way, for whoever is maybe a little shy and wants to just give me a note of a question that you want to ask, just raise your hand and we'll come by and we'll pick it up, okay? Uh, this is for Megan. If a doctor, if a patient has an allergy to a monoclonal antibody like antisabri, does that preclude them from ever using another monoclonal antibody that may be present or in the future? No, they're all very, very different. So if you have, like, um, if you developed an infusion reaction to Tysabri that made someone check your natalizumab antibody, you can't take Tysabri again, but these monoclonal antibodies are all very, very different. So no, it would not preclude your use of them in the future. Any other questions? There we go. All the way over. I'm gonna, can I do the secondhand smoke question real quick? So there is an association with secondhand smoke. Yeah, when I reviewed the studies a few years ago, they hadn't mentioned it yet, but there is an association. Mm -hmm. Megan, I was wondering, I know with MS that it's an it's a anti-inflammatory disease, and there's several others that I've noticed that go back to that. Are they working on controlling the inflammation so that you don't ever get this, or is that even a point of study? So all of the disease-modifying therapies, um, just by nature, are anti-inflammatory by the way they, um, they modify your immune system. So they either shift your T cells, which are some of your white cells, they either shift those from being pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory, or they quiet down proteins in your immune system um, that, that make inflammation happen. So they are, by and large, 
um, all anti-inflammatory. Um, since we can't predict who's going to get MS, I don't think there's a way to arrest that before, I mean, there's not a way to arrest that before it happens. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I have one question for you, Meg. Yes. Um, so when we're on the show, we're kind of talking a little bit about the fact that some of the, the over the recent past, um, some of the criteria for diagnosing MS have changed to be, again, a little bit more proactive uh, as opposed to you've had multiple X, Y, and Z, and now you have a diagnosis. Um, so with regards to that, how do you think that's going to change the way the progression of disease gets characterized in the future? So, um, Stu, can I pull, is there a way to pull my talk back up? I don't know. Um, Over here. Bill, <laughs> is there a way to pull? Okay, so um, clinically isolated syndrome, which is a first presentation, a, a first neurologic presentation, everything else all ruled out, rolled out. We're sure that this looks like MS. Um, kind of like having a clogged artery before you have a, before you need bypass, something like that. Um, and you have very few lesions on the brain. One, maybe two. Um, so our disease modifying therapies are now approved to treat clinically isolated syndrome. And the ones that are approved to treat CIS, as we call it, prevent the progression of, uh, the progression to clinically definite MS by three to five years. So I can only, I guess, give my experience. So a person that came to me in 2001, so the criteria for MS have changed over the years. The, the um, most recent guideline change was in 2010. Prior to that, it was 2005. Prior to that, it was 2001. Thanks. Um, let's see. I didn't get pictures next so, year. There's um, much better pictures than I did. <laughs> So, in 2001, um, I'm just going to I'm just going to call her Mary. Mary comes to me with optic neuritis. She loses vision in an eye. She gets better over six weeks. We do a brain MRI, and she has one spot. Um, she doesn't have an enhancing optic nerve. She just has a white spot on her brain. In 2001, I would have said, Mary, come back next time. Come back. Something else happens. Um, and if, if something else happened, but she didn't have nine or more lesions on her brain in certain areas, they had to be in certain areas, and the one that was active, we couldn't count. So Mary still couldn't have MS, even though we're all sitting around going, Mary's got MS. Like, I'm really worried about Mary, and I want to put her on this medication. Um, but we didn't have the data. We just had the intuition. So then data started to come around about clinically isolated syndrome. So now, when a person comes to my office with a clinically isolated syndrome, and you can kind of see the definition here. So one clinical attack, one lesion, that's all. One lesion, dissemination in space. So one or more lesions in areas typical for MS. Um, we would still have to wait. So we've got dissemination in space. We would either wait for a clinical attack or wait for dissemination in time, which means as soon as even three months later, we could check an MRI. And if there was a new white spot, we could diagnose clinically definite MS. But without dissemination in space or dissemination in time, with this and this and all things rule out, ruled out, we can diagnose clinically isolated syndrome and put a person on disease-modifying therapy, which means all these old statistics about in 10 years, 50% of people diagnosed with MS are going to become secondary progressive. In my mind, we're going to extend that a long period of time. So people who I diagnosed with multiple sclerosis um, between 2005 and 2010 that came in with a clinically isolated syndrome, I've been following some of these, not everyone, because some people have more severe MS than others, but I've been following these people for years, no new lesions, no relapses. That's a person with very, let's call it easy MS. Doesn't mean they don't have symptoms, they just haven't had progression of disease. So the way that we diagnose, because we can diagnose sooner, means people um, that have easy MS are doing better longer. Same thing with breast cancer, same thing with prostate cancer. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So, um, so that's why it, when, when you were talking about bladder issues, and Jody, you asked the question about bladder tacking, um, 
so we'll often talk to people who are coming in with a first like really hard neurological sign, like they really can't lift their leg or um, you know something really obvious is going on. Oftentimes we'll go back in their history and it'll be a 30 year old woman who's never had kids and she'll say, well, I mean, I've had, I've had incontinence for five years, but I just thought that happened because I was getting old, but she's 30. That shouldn't happen. You and I know? tell you, so, along that line, you know, for us urologically with urologic symptoms, for me, and, and this is only me, uh, it's a little bit controversial in the world of, of uh, urology and, and our new uh, cost-efficient healthcare delivery system, for me, before I do any kind of voiding dysfunction surgery of any type, whether it's I'm resecting a prostate because the prostate's enlarged, or whether you talk about doing slings and, and prolapse repair and things of that nature, I always get a urodynamic study. Because the last thing you want to do is do an operation and find out um, that it was because of other reasons. And again, a lot of times, you know, I, I do a lot of second opinion stuff. And so you come in with a second opinion and you get a urodynamic study and find out you know, what exactly is going on. So, and sometimes you guys send them to us and say, something's going on here. Like, this is funky. Find something in the spinal cord. I mean, and yeah. with the chooser sphincter dyssnergia, when, when you look on that urodynamic study and the bladder squeezes and the sphincter tightens, it's one of two things. It's either something neurologic or you have avoiding dysfunction where you kind of are straining or you're squatting or something of that nature. And you can really come up with that when you talk to the person. If they're like, I never squat then you got a little bit of an answer. And you can actually see things on the tracing of whether they're straining or not. So all that gives us some information of whether it's not, whether it can be pursued. I'm by no stretch of the imagination a neurologist. Do one hell of a neurologic exam, but, but that's about the extent of it. So we, again, the multidisciplinary nature of doing what you're good at and, and having your colleagues do what they're good at to come up with a, a personalized management regimen that fits the person that's going through it. Most people don't like it when I say it's time to go see the urologist. So I hope that you guys feel more comfortable about that just by being here tonight. You know, the things that that um, Dr. Ali and, and Dr. K, Dr. Ali and, and Dr. Ahmad do are, they're not doing them just because. You know, they're doing them for the same reason that we want to MRI your cervical spine this time and not just your brain. Um, and so I, I hope that your comfort level is increased with um, getting to the bottom of some of these, you know, less visible issues. Any other questions? Those two were great. Oh, you got a question. We're on hold here, everybody. We got another question. We get to all clap again in a minute. You should have said that a little sooner. Since everybody's gonna have urological issues, is there any kind of association with the onset of urological issues to the individual types of treatments for MS? Well, good question. So the question was, does the, the timing of the onset impact what you do? So, so um, it kind of depends on what's going on with the urination aspect of things. If someone is 50 years old and they're having a little bit of trouble urinating, their stream's not as strong, you can put them on Flomax regardless of what disease process is going on as long as it's a simple process. If it's something related to a neurologic issue that, that we can document on, on urodynamics or things of that nature, what we do becomes different based on what's going on. With MS um, and neurologic disorders, I, I'm always very careful at being good at diagnosing what's going on because you don't wanna do something permanent in a dynamic disease that may wax and wane and the symptoms may change. So, uh, so the advanced diagnostics become even more important to making sure we know what's going on at the very moment and what part of what's going on is bothering you the most. And then we address it in a team approach as to, to figure out what's the best thing to do. Not that I know. Yeah, no, there, there aren't, um, there's not urologic dysfunction associated at, like as a side effect, as a disease modifying treatment. Does, is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, if I take both okay. Things, okay, got it. Yeah, so there are not, um, there are not symptoms of urologic dysfunction um, as side effects of disease modifying therapy. Now, some of the disease modifying therapies, um, 
particularly Ty Sabri, Angelenia, Obagio, Tecfidera, because of the way they change your immune system, they put you at a greater risk for infection. It's not a huge greater risk, but people taking those drugs may be more prone to a urinary tract infection uh, because people with MS typically have a little bit of bladder dysfunction whether or not you know it. And so when your immune system isn't quite fighting off as infection as well as it should and there's urine sitting around, then you might be a little bit more prone to infection. But they won't cause things like urgency, frequency, incontinence, things like that. Any other questions? One more, Stu. Wow, back to the other side again. While he's walking over there with some general things that you can tell anyone, I recommend trying to go to the bathroom at least every three to four hours. Anytime you finish urinating, uh, take a breath, count to 10, go again. Get a little bit extra out. You're trying to keep the bladder as empty as possible because an empty bladder is a happy bladder. And, and, and those things really do make a little bit of a difference. Um, um, what else? Uh, the other thing is, by all means, anytime you feel like going to the urinate, try to go. There's, there, there's nothing that uh, says there's some magic to being able to hold it or training your bladder. We get this all the time with nurses, teachers, truck drivers. Or they come in with this pride that they're like camels and they urinate once a day. <laughs> with, with, with time, what is going to happen is we see this all the time. Someone comes in with a belly pain and we do a bladder scan. They got a leader in their bladder or they go to the emergency room with a pain and their bladder's up to here. You know, so, so go to the bathroom uh, on purpose uh, frequently and uh, empty your bladder. Okay, my name is Helen, and I was wondering what, um, I have progressive relapsing remitting MS, and I was wondering what does healing look like? What does healing look like? When people, has anybody ever been healed? Or in of this from yeah. of of your multiple sclerosis. Yeah. Well, we don't have a cure for multiple sclerosis yet. What we do have um, is science, and so right now, a couple of the drugs that are in like animal studies and phase one safety studies, and even phase two, there's a drug called antilingo that can actually remyelinate. So what that means is that myelin that the, uh, that the immune system attacks um, can be rebuilt. So it works a lot better. These things tend to work a lot better in animals than they do in humans. We see it happen a lot with stroke studies and with Alzheimer's disease studies. Something looks just stellar in a rat and then we do it in a human and it doesn't work. But the anti-lingo, and you can, um, you can Google that, anti, A-N-T-I, lingo, like jargon or talking, um, is, is our most promising remyelinator. A black hole can go away. Um, however, the, the usual way it goes away is because the brain resorbs that space. And so what you have left is brain atrophy. So one isn't better than the other. Um, the one thing I do want to say um, about healing is that with today's disease modifying treatments, with their efficacy, um, we, we kind of compare what's happening in MS to what happened uh, to HIV and AIDS 10 years ago in the sense that people are walking around with a disease that they still have, but it's no longer loud. So um, we can't, we don't know how to make better what's already happened yet, um, but we hope to, to stop things where they're happening now. Any other questions? Then, thank you again for coming out here today. Thank you. You two are a great team. You're a good team. I, I gotta do this again sometime. <laughs> Love it. Okay? Thank you for having us, and thank you guys for listening. Thanks, guys. See, again, we have to thank Teva Neuroscience and QuestCore Pharmaceuticals for allowing us to do today's program, giving us the option to do it, so we could have these two great speakers here.